Hello, and welcome to tonight's bull session on John Lilly's Galatea and MJ Kaufman's Galatea. I'm the Associate Artistic Director of Red Bull Theater and your co-moderator for tonight's bowl session, Nathan Winkelstein, and I use he, him pronouns. Hi, Rebecca. Hey, thanks for having me here. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca Martinez. I use she, her pronouns. I am here. I'm the Bold Associate Artistic Director at WP Theater and also your co-moderator for tonight. Um, as no doubt you know, Red Bull Theater and the Drama League paired up to co-produce a reading of John Lilly's Galatea last week, Monday. And this past Monday, and still running now, WP Theater and Red Bull collaborated on MJ Kaufman's modern adaptation of Galatea, which is called Galatea or whatever you be. And it is still streaming. It is still, you can get, um, you can still see it until 6.30 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night. So you have until then to, to check it out. And then it disappears forever. So. So take advantage if you haven't already seen it. If, if you haven't, I'm not 100% sure why you're here, but tell your friends. Um, just to uh, get some of the technical out of the way, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, enjoy the show. For those of you who are watching here on Zoom webinar with us, uh, who are going to be more actively part of the Q&A, you will see at the bottom of your screen that there is a Q&A function. If you type that, if you click on that, you can type in any questions you have and uh, you will not, I believe, see the other questions being asked. So please do not assume that no one else is asking questions, but also don't assume that everyone else is asking questions. In other words, ask questions. It's why we're here. Uh, we we want to hear from you all. So please do, um, please do do that. And that is it from a tech perspective. Yes, thank you. And so we have some fantastic guests with us tonight and wanted to see if our guests, our panelists can turn their cameras on, all of y'all. And then I'm going to invite you all to introduce yourselves and um, hey, welcome, welcome, everybody. And so I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourselves, share your pronouns if you'd like, and then share just a little bit about just like a one sentence of how you were connected to which production. And so since we'll, we'll sort of go in chronological order. So let's go with the eight, the 1585 Galatea first. And so can I tag Lauren, can I tag you to introduce yourself? We'll go with that team and then we'll come back to the, the 2018 Galatea. Is that what Go for it, Lauren. Hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Robertson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an assistant professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. And I worked with Emma on John Lilly's 1585 Galatea. So let's do that. You. Let's do that funny Zoom thing where we tag the next person because everybody's everybody's room is a little different. Uh, so Lauren, go ahead and 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 uh, I'll tag, tag Emma. Hello, friends. I'm Emma Wendt. Um, I have been the Drama League Classical Directing Fellow, sort of in residence at Red Bull for the past year, hanging out. And I directed the. Um, the 1580s Galatea, Rep and John Lilly, um, on March 15th. Fantastic. Oh. I, should I tag someone? Well, Olivia. Let's invite Olivia as, okay. as the, the other part of the, the 1585 team. I, I've been tagged. Uh, my name is Olivia Rosbarisi. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. And I am an actor uh, based in New York. And I was a part of the... Uh, the elder Galatea, if you will. Um, uh, <laughs> because I played uh, Galatea. Uh, so I'm excited to be in the mix of the conversation. And um, let me pass it back to you guys for the next- uh, Yeah, great. So let's then uh, invite MJ, if you wanna just introduce yourself and then Julie after that. I'm MJ Kaufman. My pronouns are he or they. And I wrote an adaptation of John Lilly's Galatea called Galatea or whatever you be. <laughs> and I pass to Julie Crawford. Hi, I'm Julie. I'm a professor of Renaissance literature at Columbia. And um, this is the first time I've ever been on the 
21st century team. So it's super exciting. And I got to read and write the note for <laughs> MJ Kaufman's amazing adaptation of one of my favorite Renaissance plays. So yeah, thank you. Welcome everybody. Nathan, I pass it to you. Amazing. Well, I'm 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 just gonna I'm just gonna hand it off. So we're all just gonna keep tagging one another. <laughs> I would love to, it feels like perhaps the best place to start is um with the original one since everything was inspired by that one. And I wonder, um, Lauren, if you could talk a little bit about why this play is, is which of course we would think of as a classic play, um, given its time, is a would be qualified as an early modern play. Sure. Um, so Lily, John Lilly, of course, is, is living and writing um, really right in the middle of the early modern era. Um, so-called because it's a period in England and Europe more broadly of really kind of just massive cultural, religious, political, epistemological upheaval. Um, old modes of thought and belief are gradually being supplanted by new ways of making sense of the world. Um, and as a result, the old and new are quite uncomfortably often made to coexist, to sit alongside one another. Um, this, I think, you know, you can think of many different examples. The Copernican Revolution, say, totally upends the sense of how the universe is organized in the 16th century, right? The Protestant Reformation that was felt so keenly in England really changes people's relationship to Christianity. Um, so this, I think, was not always easy to live through. Um, the poet John Donne opens a sonnet with a line that I really love where he says, oh, to vex me, contraries meet in one. And that to me, I think is just a perfect encapsulation of what early modernity is, right? It's like a vexing clash of contraries. Um, so what I think is so fantastic then about Lily's Galatea is its ability to carve out a space of ambiguity, of in-betweenness, indeterminacy, even unknowing in the midst of that kind of clash. Um, I think my favorite line in the play is when Philida says to Galatea after the two have been sort of trying to figure each other out and it's not quite working. And then Philida says, right, oh, let us into the grove and make much of one another that cannot tell what to think of one another, right? In that moment, unknowing is not only exciting, it itself is the spur to erotic desire for both of those characters, right? And so, Lily's ability, I think, to transform unknowing from something that's the kind of anxious or uncomfortable way station on the road to something that's more stable and into a state that is pleasurable, exciting, and inhabitable in its own right, that to me is what makes this a really quintessentially early modern play. Um, so I think that my colleague Julie will have more to say about what that looked like, how this play might have been staged, what it would have looked like for its original spectators. Well, I mean, I, the only thing I would say that most people might know, I assume people know, is that it was performed by boy players. And that actually really means boys, like between eight and 16. And I think that you know, one of the ways that scholars are starting to change the conversation around boy players is it used to be like, a real gender binary that part of the pleasure of early modern theater is you would see the boy beneath, you would see the boy beneath a woman. And instead, I think people are really starting to think that as this play suggests, right, that it wasn't actually a binary at all. And that in fact, one of the reasons that people went to the indoor theaters, the sort of boy player theaters is because they were a space and people experienced it then too of gender, um, not just ambiguity, which is such a slippery kind of term, but actually of transness and that there was a deep embodying of not just the other gender, but of in-betweenness of gender too. And that's sort of part of, I think what the real pleasure of it was for everybody involved. Um, and I love how the conversation around boy players is radically changing as more trans scholars join the, frankly, the academy and are getting represented in scholarly conferences where the conversation has really radically changed since I was Lauren Robertson's age, for example. So, <laughs> and it's really, you know, I'm gonna do a sort of lob to, to Emma and actually MJ 
And the law is really about what kinds, if any, I assume you did some because you both seem super informed, but what kinds of dramaturgy you guys did for your performances? Like were, you know, did you, did you dig deep into the performance history? Um, did you deep, dig deep into some of the stuff that Lauren was talking about, about sort of an age of, of radical and kind of exciting indeterminacy or not? You know, and you know, we can we can I'll lob it to Emma first because we're kind of going in historical order. Totally. Well, I mean, firstly, I will say that one of the things about working with the dramaturg, which is something that I try to do all of the time, and because I spend a lot of my time in the early modern period, particularly with Shakespeare, but with other writers as well, that having somebody who has a sort of knowledge on tap of the period actively involved in the rehearsal process is I think essential because that person's, that is one half of the translation team from, from the place of origin to the place of now, because I am here to help the actors inhabit the place of now. So having a dramaturg is one of the big things that I did, you know, and also I feel like Lauren and I had a couple of really um, important conversations during and before I went into rehearsal on the piece, but I, I did a little bit of reading. Um, I, on the one hand, I read a little bit of scholarship about the play, but I mean, as you're kind of alluded, alluding to, the, the academy is not necessarily reflecting ideals of queerness that I find contemporary or performable or livable in the body. That said, there are a couple of really interesting articles. I read a piece, um, that I'm gonna try and find, I'm gonna tread water while someone else is speaking and then find because it's in my Galatea folder on my desktop somewhere. But I read a really interesting piece um, that influenced my thinking a little bit. But basically I'm also coming from a place of having worked on a lot of queer early modern comedies shaped like this, like having had deep experiences with As You Like It and with Twelfth Night and with, you know, and like with texts where Queerness, is, I am somebody who believes that queerness is baked into the structure of Shakespeare because of having been written for a single gender company. And so the pleasure of the boy players thing is inside of how I think about the plays all of the time, because obviously it's queer on the level of the text as the characters are both women, but it's also queer beneath the level of the text because the actors are both men, you know, or like there's, there's, there's a lot of layers. So I don't know, I, ha I come to the work with a lot of feelings about that but also um, I defer to the dramaturg in matters of uh, historical relevance and then feed them to the actors as uh, required. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that the, um, the boy player performance was sort of my way into Galatea um, in that the way that I even found out the play existed was um, when I was working with the public theater on the mobile units production of Twelfth Night. And so was um, James Shapiro, a colleague of Julian Lawrence. Um, and we were, we were just like, hanging out together before a performance one day and and got into this conversation about how um, the character of Cesaria would have been costumed. That, so that's a character that um, is, is like a, a so an actor who is a boy would, was playing a woman who decides to dress up as a boy. And I said, I asked James like, what it, how would the what gender was the audience seeing basically like how was the character costumed and he said and and um i'd be curious about that julian lauren's answers <laughs> um he said um we don't know necessarily like we have the prop lists but we don't completely know what the costumes were but um probably he was just dressed as a boy and um the audience just sort of like knew or remembered that this character um was a woman be it, dressed up as a boy, um, which I loved because it felt so different from how I've ever seen Shakespeare performed. I've never, ever, ever seen that role cast that way. Um, and it also just said something to me that was like totally different about how people were seeing gender at that time. Um, and, and this sort of like 
um, collective suspension of disbelief around um, around what gender was and, and sort of the co-creation of that. So yeah, how it was performed was everything for me. It was my full way in. And when I was working on the adaptation, I, you know, I read so many um, articles and essays about <laughs> Galatea and spent so much time with the original text and called James a lot to ask questions because there's a lot in it that I didn't understand. So um, I think that that research and scholarship um, were essential and I absolutely would never have had written this adaptation without the amazing work that so many brilliant scholars have done on this play. That's terrible. It makes it sound like I set it up to be like a yay scholars. <laughs> <laughs> But I do always remember this performance I saw of Twelfth Night, which you brought up, you know, at, where at the end they had um, Viola, the, that character, change back into women's weeds at the end, which absolutely doesn't happen in the play. <laughs> and I was sitting with a bunch of academics and there was like an, out, there was like an intake of breath. It was like, <gasps> You know, and everybody else in the theater is just looking around. They're like, well, this is a romantic comedy. This is what happens is the girl <laughs> and the boy get married. And I'm like, no. And the more we insist that that's the comedic ending, the more we're reproducing something that is actually, among other things, not true to the period, right? They don't actually usually end in marriage. They, they usually end in some kind of suspension. I actually thought, Olivia, you guys did a really great job in, in, performing that suspension in your in your performance. Thank you. And that is, that is something that myself and Emma and the actor uh, Leila Krishnudi who played Philida discussed quite a great deal. A sort, and I would love to hear more of Emma's specific thoughts on that. Of course, doing such a kind of breath filled suspension and a kind of leap into an unknowing that we ourselves do not really get the answer to is hard on a virtual platform, mm -hmm. but that was definitely something that uh, felt important to the way the play wrapped up. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Emma has a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> Can I, Emma, I want to hear all of them, but I also want to give my, um, my 17 minute into the show prompt to our audience to uh, ask questions. And Emma, if we have one question so far, MJ has already answered half of it, but Emma, I think you can take the other half, which is how you both ran into this play. Mm. So perhaps in what you're about to talk about, if you could also give that, and then we're out of questions, y'all. So, you know, get going. Um, so, all right. Cool. Bam. Um, how did I run into the play? Um, uh, sim very simply, and in a way that will hopefully help me bridge into where I'm going, which is that when I was reading texts to explore for this purpose, to co-present with the Drama League and with Red Bull, it was suggested to me by a very knowledgeable scholar friend um, who knows that I have had very deep experiences with pastoral comedies before and that I have a lot of feelings about the pastoral comedy as a form. And my friend was like, you like the finding yourself in doing gay stuff in the woods plays. I don't, you'll like this. And I was like, okay. And, um, and I read it and I was super charmed by it immediately and was like, A, I think this is a, a queer text. Like I was like, this is a queer text. This is so interesting. And also I thought it was really funny. I, just as a piece, as like a piece of comic machinery, I think it's really contemporary. I think it's really funny. And I was like having a grand old time. And then I got to 5-3 when everybody turns the situation to Venus and is like, what are we going to do about these girls? And the sort of breath where Venus says, I like well and allow it. And I was sitting on the floor of my living room and I burst into tears. And because most of what I do in my lifetime is try to inhabit more expansively queer spaces in classical texts. And I was like, oh, here it is, a place where the gods approve of your love. And what you get at the end is the incredibly radical gift of a liminal space where you don't have to tie the bow. It doesn't happen. It's incredibly radical and significant that it doesn't happen. It's not an accident. The playwright is like, you don't need to see that. What you have seen is the, the, the powers of the society, both divine and human, adapt their ceremonies in order to suit this love. And every single God signs off and says, yes. So by the time I got to the end, I was like, oh, okay. Like I can live here forever. And it's also a party. It's a really good time. 
you know? So I don't know. I love it. I love it a lot. That was how I came to it is it was suggested to me by someone who knows who I, what I like. And, um, and then I was just like in it. I thought it was so fun. Yeah. Can I throw it back to MJ to say that you sort of doubled down in yours <laughs> on the deferred ending. Oh, and I love, I live for that. Um, I thought it was great. I thought it was really interestingly meta theatrical. Um, you know, and so I wondered if you wanted to talk about that, like if, you know, if that's what you felt that you were doing was like, you know, pushing that even further, like you could say, okay, at the end of the original play, it's, it's deferred. We don't know who is it going to be mm -hmm. when the wedding happens, but you sort of take another step further. Yeah. Um, well, like Emma, I was really in love with that about the original text. And um, I was stumped by the ending for, for quite a while, actually. Um, and I think how I got there was through um, the producer that I was working with at um, in in um, so at, at the WP Theater, you when you're in residence, you're paired with a director and a producer. And so I was working on this play with a director and um, this producer, Yuvika, and I was just sort of like talking about what I loved about the ending of the original play. And she she I think she said, well, what if we just we just we just don't end. We just have them sitting there, and the and the wedding doesn't happen. Um, and then the the director said instantly, like, oh, yeah, it could go on and on and on and be really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I and I loved that. Um, so that really stuck. Um, I think in my mind, it's it's sort of still in, in progress. Like, I, I haven't quite mastered that final beat in terms of how I want the like, um, direct address of Vlada and Galatea to happen paired with the sort of like existentialism of that the the gods and the parents are living in at that moment um and and you know I I want to work on that whenever we can be in 3D again and and have you know a real process um because yeah there's there's just so many layers of what's happening and I love them all and I and I'm not done playing with them <laughs> Could I I'd pass to Emma, who has something to say. Oh, oh yeah, go ahead. First, Lauren. <laughs> well, I so I would just add on to that, MJ, that um, one of my favorite, I think, pieces of criticism is by this cultural materialist critic named Alan Sinfield, who he makes this bold claim where he says, specifically about early modern drama, right, that readers do not have to respect endings. He says, we can insist on our sense that the middles of plays, especially comedies, sort of raise all of these possibilities that the endings would foreclose, right? And we can just disregard that. So um, when I was watching the ending of your play, I just felt like MJ is doing it. Like this is exactly <laughs> the ex exactly the right way to sort of both be true to an early modern play and adapt it. I loved it. And then Emma, you had thoughts, right? I did. I wanted to also jump in and say that I also don't, I'm, I also feel like I'm not done experimenting with the ending because as Olivia sort of alluded to the, the, the breath that we were trying to find inside of the liminal space on the digital form is only one expression of what I think it would be in physical space. And in physical space, I would be really interested in exploring the idea of creating the doorway, the magical doorway that the gods are speaking about building. And instead of having the play move off stage and have Galatea or both of them as I, as, as I sort of scripted it together to share, having the epilogue away from the wedding, I would be interested in exploring the idea of using that moment of music as we did it to create the marriage altar, like to create the moment and then see what it would be like for them to pass through the door, like so we'll have the audience watch them actually physically pass through the door and then experience the, the, the realization or the relief that nothing has happened. Because what does heterosexuality even mean? It's a piece of admin. Like it's like, you know, I mean, like I would be interested in watching them be unchanged. But see, you know, Alan Bray, who wrote a really beautiful book called The Friend, he was a gay historian. And he makes the point in his book that a wed 
was simply a vow made at the church door. And it could be made by same sex and was made by same sex couples that the formalization or the ownership of um, weddings by the church apparatus inside was an innovation, a money-making innovation, no offense to anybody who's taking offense, but that a wed at the church door was simply a vow, right? We've made it into the apparatus that is the wedding, right? And so, you know, you know, just hearing you guys talk, I wasn't thinking about this before, but just hearing you guys talk, like the fact that that is sort of where the play ends anyway, like you'll find out at the church door, right? It, it doesn't even necessarily like, you know, Venus. And I thought both, I thought both Venuses were great in both productions, but Venus is sort of casual, right? Yeah, okay. Olivia, you look like you wanna say something. Ooh, I mean, no, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. And it's funny, like, what's all what's been said about the vows that are given that like you know ostensibly they've been giving to each other for half the play at this point you know given everything they've been through um and then with that taking what lauren said about for early modern drama like we we can have the freedom to disregard the ending it put me in mind of kind of this and even you know as you like it which i know emma and myself have worked on before too, um, in respect of like, with early modern dramas and pastoral comedies, it was a big realization for me to get to a point with them, with the genre, uh, that they are not returning to something at the end. Something has been indelibly changed for everyone involved. Um, so there is not a going back to A, there is a whole new world that they have arrived at, um, that they have given their vows to. Uh, and I can understand there being some viewers of uh, pastoral comedies or even other actors for whom that new world doesn't feel like enough of an answer. But I feel like that is really the beauty of Galatea, both versions to me um, is like, the amount of freedom and how scary and interesting that is uh, that they get at the end. So, yeah. And I just wanna say like, this is so helpful to hear this. And it's such a reminder of how much we, when we're doing classical work right now are putting our own biases on as we are making the work and as we're viewing the work. And so it's really such a, such a, such a, a, a beautiful reminder of that, that a lot of the lens that we're putting on work is coming not from how it was viewed and how it was done when it was originally intended. So I, I, I um, we do have a question and uh, this is for anyone who feels moved to answer it. There, there, there are so many delightful characters in, in both, versions and just wanting to see like is is there a character that uh that any of you want to talk about how you feel connected who is a favorite who is is someone that you feel like particularly aligned with and it doesn't have to be the one you play olivia but it could be it could be but just wanting to open that up for folks could i actually could i put a, a limitation on it just for fun um, could it be any character who isn't Galatea or Philida? Just for a second, just to hear, because we haven't we haven't fully discussed like the Diane of some of these other subplots, which are so fascinating in this. Um, so I'd love to use it as an excuse to get in there. I can go first if you want. Um, I don't know if my it's it's like I love them all as my children or something, but um, one of my favorite characters in my Galatea and in Lily's Galatea is Hebe or Hebe. Um, I just, when I read the original or John Lily's Galatea, I was absolutely stunned by her. Um, I thought that, so she is the character who um, they attempt to sacrifice when Galatea and Philida have run away to the woods. Um, and 
her, she has the longest monologue in the play and it's the only time we see her. And she, um, it's like a complete tonal shift as far as I can tell when I was reading, it just goes um, from this like romp in the woods to um, being um, hit with the weight of um, what what this town is going through and who's paying the price for it. Um, and I, I thought that her speech was so beautiful and her her just everything about her was was gorgeous and um yeah that's all I, I was wondering if that if it was her speech that inspired the part that um it's actually an exchange between Philida and Galatea where they're talking about all the missing and sacrificed women I was wondering if it was inspired by her speech yeah yeah absolutely yeah because I, I thought that was a very moving part of of your um, revision too, like that, you know, non consensual virgin sacrifice, but also just sort of a litany of who gets sacrificed for the disasters that we insist on living in. Yeah, it's. I mean, I I was thinking about it, reading and putting my myself in the mind of Galatea and Philida, who, if this has happened every five years, there have been um quite many many generations lost and then um put thinking in in the time that i live in um how are you know young people lost and sacrificed but i pass to olivia <laughs> Ooh, um there as mj said they're all so great uh my first answer i feel like is kind of the the trio of diana and venus and neptune um, especially as they were like beautifully, hilariously played in both of these productions. Um, I feel like, you know, as a part of my education growing up, I had something of an understanding of, you know, Greco-Roman mythology and the gendered nature of that, but also the very fluid nature of that, perhaps not for, you know, the ancient Greeks or Romans, but for various other people on this planet, but it feels like it has, that's just not usually how they're presented, frankly. And I feel like this, these plays um, actually gave such a chance for what is maybe fluid in the cosmology of this world to be uh, brought to the fore in, again, such a fun, uh, honest uh, way. So I got a huge kick out of watching the work of all of the Venuses and Dianas and Neptunes in both of the shows. I loved them. And I'm gonna pass it to Emma. Oof. Um, well, I also have great love for Hebe and great love for the gods, but um, I'm gonna go Rafe. I'm gonna go Rafe on this one. He's my boy. <laughs> I love Rafe. What a maniac. I mean, um, one of the, I sort of couldn't believe him when I was first reading it. I was just like, my dude, what are you doing? I, I don't know. The, the embodiment of, I mean, he's a source of a lot of the, of the, of the silliness and joy, but the sort of fool's journey that is so pure in this play that is sort of emblematic of a certain type of comedy of the period that is like, no matter what, I'm in search of what is satisfying and ebullient in the universe. And I'm going to find it no matter how many times I get knocked down. And the sort of Candide-like kind of from one chapter to the next journey of Rafe. And just the fact that like, there is nothing that can get a fool down. <laughs> and I don't know, I mean, obviously Nathaniel Claridad who, who played him in, um, in, our, in our reading is a stone cold genius. And so it was so fun to collaborate with him on the character, but also I feel like his, I'm interested in what he's doing in the play. I feel like his, his, he almost forms a trio in my mind between Galatea and Philida and himself as three young people who are kind of set adrift in the landscape of this play, looking for their destiny or looking for their place. Destiny is a word that gets brought up in the play like 8,000 different times by almost everyone. And everybody is in search of this destiny. And the fact that in each 
strand of the plot, the people that Rafe bumps into and the people who, you know, orchestrate Gallenfield's lives are all men who think they understand how the universe works. And obviously I made the choice to double cast those men so that you really see the same men in every corner of the play trying to explain to you how the universe works. But it just struck me that Rafe was just another young soul bopping around looking for his place. And I like how he does it. Can I ask a can I ask a follow up there for MJ um, because we, you you removed that subplot um, from from your play? Can you talk a little bit about your wh wh why that choice was made? Yeah, um, to be honest, I don't completely remember because I think it was maybe three or four years ago that I wrote this, but um, I remember just that there w it was a it was kind of a lot. I think that um, sort of three interlocking stories for a contemporary play is a bit of a tall order um, that that um, is just less common now. Um, and I, I didn't, I don't know, they didn't fit in my world somehow. I don't, yeah, um, I think that's, that's right. I, I loved, I loved them in, um, in Emma's production and I loved getting to, to see that. Um, and I, and I don't completely remember just that they, they kind of didn't fit and, and sort of the amount of, um, of story felt like a lot for what I wanted to do. Amazing. Does anybody else have a particular favorite character they want to jump in on or should I ask the next question? I would I don't just Oh, I would just say I'd give a quick shout out to Cupid. Partly it's because both Cupids were so good. <laughs> um, but also because Cupid has the most Lillian language, right? That what Lauren was talking about really beautifully before about it's a play that sort of produces endless sort of possibilities that it doesn't foreclose, it, 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 it accumulates, right? And you just heard that in Cupid's language. Both Cupids were so great, but the, in the original play where you do hear the, you know, the, the Lily's language of continual, like the, a heart full of coldness, a sweet full of bitterness, like that continual rolling, it's, you know, there's formal terms for it, but listening to it in this sort of smiling, amazing, joyful, erotic, gold jacket wearing character just sort of made it that much, you know, more amazing. I'll be true to my original answer and not change it. But like Emma, I have a real soft spot for Ray. He's very lovable. I love his openness and resilience. So my answer is the same. <laughs> Amazing. So just a quick follow up. This probably goes to the scholars. Um, this is from uh, Michael Garber. Sorry, I should have been saying who's been asking all these questions. Quick shout out to Jamie Cleland, uh, Emily Hahn. Apologies for that last name if I messed it up. And then someone named Annie Namus Attendee. Uh, that was a joke. <laughs> all right. Um, so um, uh, Michael Garber asks in this uh, era, uh, era, geez, era of religious turmoil in England, how was this play uh, received by the Cromwell followers and the Catholics, et cetera, et cetera? Well, Cromwell ain't for a bunch of years. Cromwell for quite a while. Like, what are the given circumstances in the world outside politically? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, Lauren, you want to take it? I think probably one answer to the question of how would it, the play have been received by Catholics is that I think they probably liked it. Um, you know, we we know very little, um, unfortunately, about how um, individual people responded to particular plays. That information is just so, excuse me, so scant in the period. Um, we do know, thanks to to recent scholarship, that um, the confessional sort of mix up of audiences in the theater was mixed, more mixed than. Um, a few generations ago, we would have thought. So I would say highly likely that Catholics are in the audience, highly likely that, that they're having a good time. As a follow-up, the boys, and apologies if I'm totally wrong here, were, that was a much more, uh, that was a much less accessible show to see than at, at the Globe, right? This was a, would have been a much more contained audience. Is that, is that correct? 
Yeah, they were this, the Playhouse, the Blackfriars was the one that Lily was sort of dramatist in residence for. And that was, you know, it was indoor and it was smaller. And because it was smaller, it was also more expensive. But there's, there's sort of a, Lauren knows far more about this than I do. But there was a really great book by Mary Bly many years ago on queer virgins and virgin queens. So I think talking about, you know, that people went to particular um, playhouses and saw particular boys companies because they actually did produce, among other things, queer insider jokes and knowledge. So that's just something to chew on. Lauren, I don't know if you want to add anything. You know, I think at this, this is a pretty early moment in terms of the kind of emergence of the theater as a commercial industry in London. So Lily is really one of the figures who um, helps popularize a commercial theater outside the confines of the court. I think one of the things that's important to remember is that these plays are technically rehearsals. They're rehearsals for performances that will eventually be done at court in front of the queen, right? So. In the late 1580s, what we're really witnessing is the kind of gradual shift of theater as something that happens at court and its movement out into the wider world of London. Yeah, so it's worth saying at this point, just for people who don't know, that this play was performed before Elizabeth and that Elizabeth I, many people know this, herself often configured herself as Diana with her nymphs, her ladies in waiting were often configured in that way. And it was fully, don't worry, it was fully homoerotic. <laughs> is this the time, and this is just making me, me curious, was, was this type of work commissioned, knowing that a lot of work was commissioned by royalty? Was this something, what, what, was there a culture of, hey, I'm just gonna write a play? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna sit in my studio and write a play? Or, or how did it work for, for playwrights at this time? That's a great question. Um, in some ways, this industry is pretty heavily regulated. Um, for performances at court, there's sort of one person who reviews and decides which plays will be performed at court. So that's where we get the, but that's where Shakespeare gets that great scene in Midsummer Night's Dream, right? When um, they're deciding what will be performed before Theseus and Hippolyta, right? Um, it's also true though that, you know, one thing about Lily in particular is that playwriting was sort of his plan B. <laughs> um, he really wanted either an academic position, um, or to be a courtier in Elizabeth's court. And so when that didn't work out, um, playwriting was his way of gaining access to the queen without being in her inner circle. Um, so he certainly has, right? His own sort of career agenda, a political agenda when he's um, writing plays in the hopes of, of sort of getting in front of her. Mm -hmm. But also his patron, Oxford, fancy, you know, was also trying to repair and work on his own relationship with court factions too. So, but you know, the important thing I always say about that is obviously if you've ever read a Shakespeare play, you know that it's never plangent, even when there's an allusion to the king himself, like James the first as there is in Macbeth, it's never plangent dumb dumb flattery, right? It's it's never some kind of abasements nor is it ever some simplistic, you know, state or statement of, of political conviction, right, in a, in a sort of obvious flat-footed way. So playwrights are at one time communicating their own sort of feelings and sometimes politics and, you know, navigating a relationship with the structures of power, but it's never sort of one-way objection, you know. Um, I, I know Shapiro was already mentioned at one point uh, today. I, I am curious, He one of the things that I, I most enjoy about Shapiro's scholarship is that he takes that kind of inverted approach to scholarship where he goes, we can probably learn the most about a play or a playwright by the time, because the time is actually what we know about. Um, and uh, and I fully suggest for anybody who's listening who hasn't read Year of Lear or uh, 1601 or um, read it because they're amazing books. But is there, I know that it's specific, uh, especially tends to be true of comedies that they tend to be very much responding to um, contemporary impetus 
Uh, was there anything in this? Was it just having the Virgin Queen? Was it what? What was the impetus for Lily to write this play? Was there anything going on in the time? If the answer is no, that's fine. I'm just curious. Well, I would just say, like, part of queer reading is queer temporality, and that to quote Alan Sinfield again, who Lauren quoted about something else. Alan Sinfield has a great line, I think, from the '80s where he said, look, if gay men, that was the demographic he was interested in the movie. So if gay men say that Sebastian or Anthony speaks to them, he speaks to them. There's no sort of historicist correction. And I think actually that mode like that can sometimes pretend to pass for objectivity, right? Like we have the facts, um, you know, is one that, I think a lot of other kinds of scholars want to invite people to really resist and sort of, you know, the idea of sort of touching or identifying or feeling across time without self-disciplining to say, but there were no homosexuals in 1588, you know, um, is sort of a way that I, for one, you know, want people to read, right? I mean, I think it's, it's convenient in a play like, um, Lily's plays in general, who they're called Sappho and, you know, or they're called Galate, they're not historically topical. People can say, okay, we're. Julie, we've, we've, if you can hear us, uh, we've, we've lost you right at like your seminal point. Um, uh well could is there anyone else who wants to take this while we see if julie can come back as she leaves us all in suspense stick around um <laughs> um yeah i well i mean this is not directly related to that but i do have a question for you mj which is how much of this of of the the political worldview how much of the intention of how when lily was writing this and and the political um ambitions, I guess I would say, how much of that, or did any of that influence any of the writing that, that you did or the research that you were doing in, in your work? Probably, but I think it's like at the time that I was working on it, I was like really immersed in the context for a while. And then I was just writing and I can't necessarily, pin a like one to one on each thing. Um, like I'd forgotten, I think until this conversation about um, Queen Elizabeth fashioning herself like Diana with the nymphs. Um, I'll, but I, I remember reading about that. Um, hmm. Yeah, and I, and I remember talking with James about the um, theater where it was performed. And I, I remember trying to get him to like, map it onto like a New York theater world and being like, okay, so if Shakespeare, if that's like, you know, Broadway, where's Lily? Is that like Soho rep? And he was like, doesn't, doesn't really go like that. Um, <laughs> um, so I don't know if I can answer. I think, I think that I sort of got pretty quickly swept up in the political moment that I was in and wanting to reflect mm -hmm. like, um, you know, kind of like Trumpian power in Neptune and the, some of the like, um, you know, anxieties around climate change and, um, you know, all, all of the different things that we're living through right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But um, Julie, now that you're with us, I would love to hear what you were yes. on the verge of sharing moments ago. I don't know where I got cut off. I had to go yell at my kids to get off the internet. Um, where I don't know where I got cut off. <laughs> I think it's more like I was just sort of like, you know, as somebody who's done quite a lot of historicist work in my time and has, you know, I'm very interested in, in literature's engagement with, you know, historical specificity. But I also think part of the joy of, um, of, reading literature is that it does invite identifications across you know huge distances and it invites kinds of feelings that are not determined or fixed by by the conditions either of reception thank god or of creation thank god you know 
And so I, it's the, that line from Alan Sinfield is what I think about all the time, you know, like what a radical thing it was to say, um, you know, if gay men decide that he's theirs, then he's theirs. Like he's, nobody else gets to come in and say, well, no, you're, you're misreading or you're misappropriating. Um, you know, the alterity is so much that you have to stay over there, <laughs> right? Historical alterity demands that you don't feel or identify or co-inhabit, you know? And that just has always seemed a really deadening way to read things that invite such speculative and imaginative participation. Olivia. I would love to, your, what you just said really made me excited and I could go off on this for a long time and I know Emma has heard me go off on this for a long time, but um, that, what you just said for me as a performer is one of the chief joys of working in classical, working with classical text. Um, and I know that there are a lot of performers that feel the opposite to me in this way. And I hope to change that in their minds maybe one day. But for me, if I look at Galatea and I claim it for my 2021 self, who, who, is, who, who should be telling me that that is not right or okay? So while I myself am interested on a historical level in um, what the historical moment can teach me about the story and what I can take from that. There is a massive amount of freedom in getting to work on a classical text and start with just what I have here and in the moment that I am in right now. Um, and again, I know there, there are a lot of people in the theater that don't feel that way for very, very good reason, of course but I hope that other people feel as Alan Sinfield kind of wants to recommend that kind of freedom with this type of work. But I would love to hear people disagree with me on that. I mean, I'm just gonna say something, I'm not a panelist, but I'm gonna say that I think there, there is something that sometimes uh, there feels like there's a barrier to access classical work because we are we are sort of like given this uh, there are these rules there's this thing you got to do it this way you got to have the costumes with the roughs and you got to have like all this stuff and unless you know the rules you can't play and i think what that does is it doesn't allow for that individual connected connectivity to the work to the words to the enduring story and allowing us to find our own our own way into a story that moves us. So, like that to me, what you, what you just said and what all of you have just been sharing feels feel, feels really relevant. Relevant, and I'm saying this as a person who has felt very intimidated by classical work in the past for those reasons. So, Absolutely. like, and like just to like jump on that because you were so right about that. Um, I have so many fellow actors, so many other theater people, like the amount of times people have looked at me and said, why would I do Shakespeare when I feel like I don't, I don't know the rules? Or like, it's not for me. Or why would I do Lily if I don't know the rules? And it's, I 100% agree. And I do hope through the work that Red Bull does and other companies like this, people can see that the rules really can be what you make them. Mm -hmm. this is, you know, whoever you are, however you are coming to it, the rules can be what you need them to be at that time. So thank you for saying that, Rebecca, because mm -hmm. I hope that changes very much so. But also to go back to Rafe again, oh, I see you, Emma, and I'm just gonna praise your Rafe, where you know, what you see is that that playing on words, that punning, that picking it up and running with it, those are the vernaculars of all kinds of people. That, that you know, that's not the vernacular of Shakespearean English. You know, it's a, it's a, it, it, it absolutely invites whether it's written for somebody with a Welsh accent or not, right? It absolutely invites that kind of pleasure of the pun and the play on words and the running with it and the taking the piss, um, you know, and that, that it's why it 
work so beautifully with any kind of vernacular, as opposed to somebody feeling like they are supposed to, as Olivia is saying, sort of button them up and sound like they went to Oxbridge or something, you know. <laughs> I will, I will jump in on that if I may, Nathan, unless you had another thing. Just no, I'm, I'm trying to resist also jumping in. Because yeah, no, I, I must, I must. Uh, yeah, go. I have to. Well, I mean, I, thank you, thank you, uh, Julie and Rebecca and, you know, and Olivia for all of that stuff, because that's, Rebecca, what you're speaking to is my whole, um, is my whole life mission, really, is that this is everybody's party. The past is yours, come home. The work is yours, come home. It doesn't have to be, that's not a thing. You know what I mean? Like, it belongs to you, put it in your body, alchemically transform it, speak it like it belongs to you. That is my entire way of, that's, that's, that's all I ever wanna do with the work. And the thing that, that the, I think Julie was just speaking to about the fact that, Race, but also so many of the characters. I mean, the success of, of these texts is when they get big hearted because we are allowing ourselves to share something truthful about our own experience, but also the joy in wordplay is contemporary and is vernacular and like, and also like most of it's filthy. I mean, and it also like, it invites a spirit of invention and of silliness. But I feel like sometimes, I don't know, I feel like there are invitations in these texts that are really exciting to me as a theater maker to work against all of the things that you're speaking about, which are coming down perhaps from, from academia, from antiquated training, from systems that have prohibited access. But I feel like the, the invitations are so much about liveness and goofiness and, and inventiveness and audacity and modes that I think even in the contemporary theater we're sometimes afraid of to to be that stupid to be that silly I mean so many of the jokes in in Galatea are so dumb that what we found ourselves doing I mean we've been having a very sort of uh we've been having of course uh an emotional and kind of politicized conversation about the grander themes of the play but also on a granular level on a scene level when you're really working in it it's very stupid bit and like part of the fun is that you show up at the table and you're like, what is this bit today? And then like you sign into rehearsal and Jason O'Connell's wearing a gas mask and you just live your life. Like, I don't know. It's, it's also very silly and I appreciate that. But to the deeper point, to the deeper point, I think what you're speaking to is a huge um, thing, is a huge discussion about point of entry and about, be, and about welcoming and about invitation, about a spirit of invitation into the work. Well, also, I think that there's like, I mean, not to get too serious, but like structures in theater that have kept a lot of actors from being able to claim Shakespeare, like um, training programs where, you know, they have like, you have to, you have to, there's a binary gender system. They have really traditional ideas about who can play what role. Um, and it's a shame, honestly, because I feel like at, for, for classical work, but also for contemporary work, because um, I think that one thing that I've noticed is that the actors who um, who I who I love in my own work are often actors who also are who also perform classical work. Like for instance, Anish, who was in both readings of Galatea and who is in a ton of my work, um, is a brilliant Shakespeare actress. Um, and also brilliant at contemporary plays because a lot of contemporary work is also language driven um, and is also based in like a kind of absurd comedy. Like I think there's qu actually quite a lot of um, commonalities between um, a like, a, like I, don't, I don't know what to call it, new work that is not in a realist tradition right now <laughs> and um, early modern drama. I think that there's like a lot of, a lot of things in common um, and you know, it's like one of the reasons why I just like love, love, loved getting to be in the rehearsal room for my adaptation of Galatea because I finally get to see um, trans and non-binary actors play every single role, every single character in the world when um, we have so many theaters and training programs and institutions that have said like, you don't fit here, you don't belong in any of these roles or maybe you belong in this one little tiny one. Um, and to just like get to see our whole world created that way. Um, is really special for me. That's therapy. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, it was really joyous watching it, like from the first second of watching that performance. Like my 11 year old daughter came in at some point. She's like, everybody looks like they're having a really, really good time. <laughs> and that was my initial response. But then, you know, at the end, you're like, well, of course, having non-binary and trans performers play that those parts, play that play a whole. And this is Emma, you made this point already but a whole world of meaning becomes newly experienced and that meaning feels, and I, you know, Lauren, you can weigh in too, felt absolutely deeply true to the play, right? To the spirit of, of the play. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, I sort of have a question that I think is related to this that Olivia, I've wanted, I've been wanting to ask you about. Um, so the scholar Simone Chess, she has this really great reading of Galatea where she talks about, is that what was this on your is, desktop? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> is it, is it cross-dressing cross sex and gender labor? Yeah, yeah I have it yes. open right now. <laughs> so the labor of gender, right, where she talks about um, gendered presentation as, not some, as something that's not individual, but socially constructed, right? It requires... Um, the work and val validation from Galatea and Philida both when they're saying sort of like, I don't know how to be a boy, I'll just watch that person, right? Um, and so Olivia, I was really wondering if that idea of a kind of social construction of gender, does that translate to a rehearsal process? Um, or if, if that's related or if there are different, um, different things going on when you're sort of preparing the part? That was absolutely related to the work that we did. Um, and I believe I have also, Emma sent me this article. I think I actually have read this myself. And this was something that was a huge part of the conversation between myself, Layla, who's uh, our Philida, and Emma. Um, and again, as, as an actor doing classical text, one does have the impulse, at least to start, to um, make sure I, I'm pinning down the facts. I'm making sure there's an A, B, C. Uh, what do they know at this moment? Okay, I want to be really clear. I want to make sure I'm getting it, getting it right. Again, to call, to call back to kind of the sometimes not helpful and toxic language that we use with classical text. Um, I want to make sure I'm right about this and that it's correct. But for Galatea, it was very helpful and freeing for me to realize that. The, the real act and the real ask of being in scenes with Layla was what we were creating between us on a social level, um, re-gender. Uh, uh, there wasn't an ABC answer to what I felt about my gender and what she felt about her gender moment to moment. It was truly something that we had to find between us. Again, over Zoom, not easy to do. Um, but we did put a lot of work into that and Emma led us through that very beautifully. The sort of um, taking us through the act together of creating whatever it was that we were moment to moment and also realizing and accepting that that liminal space really was the work. Um, standing in that liminal space really was the work. Uh, I, I felt very excited that we got towards it on Zoom and I, and I, it was very exciting. And it, it's definitely the sort of thing that I would love and would have loved to do in person, especially with this uh, topic. But Emma, I, I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts on that as well. I do, I, I just wanted to say, since we brought up the, the chess, that that is a great article and she makes a, a beautiful point. Um, uh, she makes a beautiful point in there about how gender labor, as she sort of terms it and expounds it in the piece, is um, a big part of that creative act that's shared, in, is about the act of forgetting actively what you know. And I thought about that a lot, and also it's something that has like resonance in my life as a queer human being in a queer partnership as a queer interpreter of the text like you know and so I found it quite moving and sort of intense and the idea that um part of the romancing and part of the part of the magic of what is happening between the characters is an agreement to not know 
what it is poetically inconvenient for you to know. And that I think is really sort of important and a degree of nuance that I think sometimes escapes from contemporary dialogue about gender. There was something really tender and really delicate about that phraseology to me. And, you know, I mean, some of it was, was quite um, dense and, and I don't know, I thought, I mean, I think it's a brilliant, I think it's a brilliant piece. And I, and it, it's just interesting, this question of so many questions about dramaturgy and how do you apply them to the work, especially when you're asking for really specific individual tender expressions from actors in a body interpreting the language themselves. But that I did find to be a really potent idea about the fact that like when an actor comes to you and is like, what exactly do I know at this moment? I think you have to find a way to answer their question on the scene level to take care of the practical, but to also to keep, to keep open the reservoir of all the things that you're agreeing to not know. And that's rich and tricky. And that was something that I brought into the process in my own self and my own curiosity about the relationships from that piece of writing. That makes me think of a question for Olivia. Um, in um, the Galatea, in, in our rehearsal room, um, the actors playing Galatea and Philida had this question about when they come out of the woods and um, they say, oh my gosh, it was, it was Philida this whole time. It was Galatea I was in love with this whole time. Is it a performance for the gods and their parents? And they actually knew who they were falling in love with or do, did they really not know? And we spent a really long time talking about that question. Um, and I wondered if, if you have that question and how you answered it for yourself as an actor. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I loved uh, watching it in your Galatea as well. Um, and I would love to hear more from you about kind of where your actors kind of fell on that. <sighs> moment, again, this is so about the unknowing of Galatea, isn't it? Moment to moment. I often felt that Philida would answer that question one way and Galatea would answer that question a very different way. Um, for myself, Galatea in The Lily, uh, there is something that was so young, so, um, forgive me for putting it this way, but like neither of her parents had ever given her any kind of talk yet. So like when, like, which is so an embarrassing way to put it, but truly like when she meets Philida and starts to experiment with her in whatever way that they do, I did not feel that Galatea necessarily even had the language with which she would normally label what they did, what she had, what she, she had, what that was. So for myself, a lot of Galatea, when they finally came out of the forest, that, it is a degree of magical thinking, but for Gal, at least, it sort of felt like she was really like, whoa, I really am, bowled over by this as she was for so much of the <laughs> for so much of the play um but i would love to hear your thoughts on kind of where your actors came down on that conversation yeah i think we ended up with a more um a more like literal um performance of it i think it ended up being that they they knew that they, who they had fallen in love with and were um, were like feigning surprise for their, for the sake of their parents or the gods, I think was where the actors ended up. But I mean, but we, it was after a long conversation about that's not the whole story and there's sort of suspension of disbelief in any kind of falling in love and in, you know, any kind of um, co-creating gender and power in a relationship. Um, but I think that that was sort of what, um, what worked the best in terms of how we were going to play that moment. Um, and, and also I think for the, the statement that we wanted to make in terms of like claiming the queerness of it. Well, I think that might be, unless anybody is super inspired to get anything else in, I think that might be a good time, 
a good place to place to wrap this. What a wonderful conversation. Oh, kind of a far ranging conversation. Thank you all. Um, at, at this point, we now do a bunch of like, what's coming next stuff for the people who are watching. And then there's a really sudden cutoff when I end the meeting. So I just want to make sure that we, and I'm sure Rebecca will want to speak to, thank you now for joining us for this panel. Cause then it'll be like, oh, I'm gone. Um, so thank you all so much for joining for this. I know that our audience is thrilled and, and, and thank you for digging into it the way you have. Woohoo! Yeah, and for for um, Rebecca, please do pitch anything that's coming up next at WP for Red Bull Lights. Uh, look out next uh, month for Paradise Lost Part One and Two uh, adaptation by Michael Barakiba mm -hmm. that he's been working on for a decade. Um, that's on April twelfth and April twenty sixth, and then on and on April fifth, even before that, we're going to be doing a remarkable conversation hosted by yours truly, um, where I'll be chatting with J. O. Sanders about Falstaff and the banish all the world scene. So definitely look out for that. Uh, Rebecca, what's going on, what's going on at WP? We're making a movie at WP. So uh, starting streaming on April 15th, we are inviting folks to see Waitlist, which is a theatrical concert film that is made by the Kilbanes, who are in a fantastic band from the West Coast, directed by Tamala Woodard. And it is, it is a beautiful story. It is um, both a storytelling in concert and some fantastic music. So we, so, you know, come, come, come check it out. Amazing. Well, thank you all, everybody. Have a good night. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk again soon.